Hugh Davey, welcome to Listening with Leaders. You are the CEO and co-founder of Bonsai, which is an interesting webinar marketing platform and can be found at Bonsai, B-A-N-Z-A-I dot I-O. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, you know, I, I interviewed you on Authority Magazine and I, I really, I probably less than half the people I interview I want to have on my podcast, but you re we really flagged you because you have such an interesting story. Tell us a little bit about your backstory. Uh, well, I grew up on the East Coast in uh, North Carolina, grew up in a really small kind of rural uh, town there and uh, moved to the big city of Durham when I was uh, about 15, uh, went to school at uh, University of North Carolina uh, at Chapel Hill. And uh, my first job out of, uh, out of high school was working at uh, IBM uh, as a software uh, developer, kind of, a, you know, over the summer before I started college. And then I stayed on for a while. So for a while there, I was, you know, working at IBM uh, during the day and going to class in the morning and then going to work after class and then coming home and trying to study. And so uh, all of that got to be a little um, overwhelming. And uh, I, I really got interested in entrepreneurship and decided that that was a path I wanted to pursue. And uh, I originally um, became aware of that, you know, just aware of the concept because both of my parents were teachers, you know, so I had never heard the word entrepreneurship uh, and they're both English teachers even for that matter. Uh, so although they're they're both you know very very uh, you know smart people and very accomplished people in their own right you know I always just assumed I was going to go be a professor in some college somewhere I wasn't really aware that there was a, a second option you know and uh, and so I uh, when I was in in school actually uh, I had a, a class an economics class, uh, which incidentally became my major when I was at, at Carolina. And um, in that economics class, the professor brought in two entrepreneurs to talk to the class about entrepreneurship. And uh, I, I, it was the first time I became familiar with the concept. And uh, I, I, I loved that. I loved the concept. And so um, I actually became friends with, with both of those um speakers uh in in later years both of them were still close friends of mine and i actually spoke to one of them just yesterday uh but there's um you know for me that was uh you know i, I after i got out of high school I, I went and tried the kind of traditional you know thing my the thing my parents thought of as a good job and a good career which was go work at ibm and you can stay there your whole career and they'll pay you really well and it's a safe business and um I came in at a time when IBM was going through a lot of transition. They were, uh, they had just uh, sold off their ThinkPad division, uh, but everybody was still using ThinkPads. Uh, you know, MacBooks were still kind of uh, verboten, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know they had, but they still owned their server business, and they were kind of going through this transition from being a uh, a, a maker of machines. Um, to do calculations, which was their original business, to really more of a, uh, and really being a product innovation led company, because that's what IBM was for many, many years. And they were going through a transition from being a product innovation led company to being a customer solutions oriented company um, and focusing more on consulting, putting solutions together, you know, working with enterprises to, 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 to develop, uh, you know, hardware, software, customized approaches to their problems. And so it was an interesting time to be there. And I learned a lot. But the main thing that I learned was um, that I really just wasn't in love with the idea of being a software engineer. And uh, I, I loved working on software. I loved writing code. But I really was much more interested in what was going on in the business. Um, and it felt like there was a bit of a wall there. And I think that's not just true at IBM. I think that's true, you know, pretty much anywhere. Um, and so, you know, I felt like if I want to uh, be able to kind of do both, then I probably uh, need to, uh, you know, be in a, a smaller organization where I can have more direct impact. And that was my, that was my, you know, 19 year old uh, thinking at the time. So, uh, yeah. So I, I, anyways, I ended up starting a company uh, in my, uh, while I was at Carolina uh, 
and uh, it it uh, kind of took off uh, a little bit, and we raised some venture capital money and uh, kind of got off to the races, and and uh, I ended up dropping out of Carolina in my senior year, and so uh, I've been uh, kind of working as an entrepreneur ever since then, and I had to go through the very tough process that a lot of founders have to go through of um, you know, transitioning from being somebody who's probably a pretty decent software engineer uh, or pretty decent salesperson or whatever skill set they happen to bring to being somebody who's you know actually got more of a leadership skill set, and uh, that transition was a pretty painful one for me, and you know stubbed my toe uh, a number of times along the way. But Let, let's stop right there because that's something that that I think everybody's interested in. What yeah. what made transitioning from being a doer? to being, or a producer, to being a leader? What were the challenges that you faced there? Well, the main the main challenge I think that I faced and that a lot of um, entrepreneurs face is, you know, you, you, could, you could call it something friendly, but basically it boils down to arrogance. Um, you know, you, you believe that nobody can do it as good as you. Right. And so uh, what ends up happening is, you know, you end up feeling like you either have to do it or you have to micromanage it. Um, and eventually you either burn yourself out or you burn your team out, um, or you make enough mistakes, uh, that, you know, you burn your company out. And so, uh, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, uh, I, I, I've worked, been really fortunate to work with some really great mentors over my career. And, um, the, probably the, you know, person that had the biggest impact on my career was. Uh, a guy named Kevin Regelsberger, who was the uh, president at Avalara. Um, so uh, when I was, uh, I think maybe 22 or 23, we sold uh, the assets of that first company that I started. Um, and I uh, eventually ended up going to work uh, with Kevin when I was 24 as a general manager of a business at Avalara that they had acquired in really what at the time was um, like the first general manager in the company. And so wow. we were trying to build the framework for how do we do this well, um, but also how do we grow the business quickly? And um, it was, you know, a bit chaotic at times, but ultimately, um, you know, the, the lessons I learned from Kevin were, uh, you know, Kevin had this amazing ability to manage things that he didn't know um, that much about by trying to figure out you know, just one or two details that you would have to have done right if you were doing the job right. And, you know, Kevin's approach was, I'm not going to focus on uh, trying to figure out every single thing that needs to be in your plan and do it all for you. Kevin's approach was, I'm going to figure out the one or two things that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, you would have had to have thought of if you were going to do this right, or you would have to know, or you would have to you know, be at this milestone. And, uh, and I'm going to make sure that that you've thought about those things. And it was really, it, you know, it was this really incredible kind of high leverage approach to management. And then eventually, I read a book um, while I was at Avalara uh, by Andy Grove, uh, former, you know, uh, CEO of Intel, uh, called High Output Management. And uh, that book completely changed my perspective on, uh, on, you know, working with people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I would say beyond that, I've had probably a, a litany of coaches and, uh, you know, 360 reviews and all the, all the thing, all the horrible right. uh, things you can do to yourself. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, that, that, that over time, uh, you know, I've, I, I think I've developed a better sense uh, of, of how to be an effective leader, but uh, it's definitely wasn't something that came naturally to me uh, in the, in the early days. And I don't think it comes naturally to a lot of entrepreneurs. I no. think it's, 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 it's a, it's a skill set. It's a muscle that you have to build. And if you don't, you know, if you don't exercise that muscle, uh, you know, you shouldn't expect to be great at it. I think. I mean, you think about, think about the military. I mean, the U S army starts leadership training right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, if you're a corporal and you want to go to sergeant school, you've got to do a 30 day basic leadership course before you can even qualify to apply for the sergeant school. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, yeah, what's interesting to me is that the military has really figured out how to develop leaders that work for its mission, but the, the business world has not. And people like you are 
uh, exceptions to the rule, I think, where where uh, many people never really learn how to be a leader, and yeah, that, and that creates that creates real challenges for them. Uh, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, there's a, we, we like the saying around here, figure out what works and do it. Right. Uh, so eventually, you know, if you try what doesn't work enough times, you know, uh, you you hopefully have some blind luck and you figure out something that will work. And that's basically what happened um, in my case when it came to, when it came to leadership, I just kind of kept, you know, kept at it uh, until until I figured out how to stop screwing it up. <laughs> But but I think it's a really good point. You know, it, when when you're in the when you're in the military, you know, the, there's kind of a path for you. There's there's resources for you, and a lot of big companies have uh, have that as well. You know, like a, like at IBM, you know, if you want to go into management at IBM, it's probably a similar thing. You know, you have to you know uh, go through different trainings and different classes, and you know, they kind of teach you how to do it over time. Um, entrepreneurship is really like. Uh, like, you know, packing yourself into a cannon and then reaching out and setting the fuse, uh, <laughs> exactly. yourself, you know, and Just jumping into the deep end of the pool without really knowing how to swim. <laughs> that's, that's that's right. Yeah. And and so, you know, there's not as many resources for entrepreneurs out there. Uh, one resource I was really lucky to find, although I wish I'd found it a lot sooner, um, was the entrepreneurial master's program that EO does. Um, they do it in partnership. Uh, they, they, they host at MIT. And um it's it I, i've been in it for uh for two years now so this upcoming may that'll be my third uh year and it's a of a three-year program but it's basically they get a bunch of entrepreneurs together from all over the world and then they bring in uh people to talk about leadership and you kind of sit there for four days and just get crammed full of uh information and then you have to go back with your groups and and you have to you get to talk about it once a month and kind of talk about how you're applying it and I, you know, I found that to be uh, just really super beneficial for me as somebody who, you know, I never got an MBA uh, right. and I never, I never went through the, you know, sergeant school or through the IBM executive training program, right. you know. So. Um, so you've got, bon you're with Bonsai now. It's a, it's, from what I can tell, looking at the website, you guys have a, it's a sophisticated webinar video production platform. Would that be correct? Well, uh, largely that's what we are today, but our vision is a little bit bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, with Bonsai, what we're building is uh, a, a platform business uh, to, to fill in the gaps around marketing automation. So you have a company like HubSpot that has 145,000 customers, whatever the number is, and uh, they're very, uh, you know, they're, they're very firmly cemented as the leader in marketing automation. They're, you know, they own the emails and the landing pages and a little bit of the reporting in the workflow. Um, but, but really, you know, that's a, a fairly essential and mission critical piece of businesses and they're gonna own that. But there's a lot of things around um, HubSpot that are also essential mission critical things that HubSpot doesn't do and most likely never will. Um, so we think about those things in three categories. One is uh, lead acquisition. So basically, how do you get leads into HubSpot? Um, two is engagement. So basically, once they're in there, what do you do with them? You know, uh, yeah, you can send them emails, but what are you sending them emails about? Right. Uh, and you know, so that's things like webinars and uh, content and all of that. And then you know, three is that is the analytics reporting and the data kind of plumbing. Um, so things like you know marketing ETL or, uh, you know, CDP, uh, attribution, uh, you know, ROI tracking, things where, uh, you know, moving data between systems, uh, you know, workflow automation, all of that. And all of that's essential in, in a typical, you know, marketing stack. And the, the average enterprise today uses 120 different uh, marketing SaaS uh, wow. products. So HubSpot might be one of them. But that means that there's a, another 119 around it that are also mission critical that aren't HubSpot. And so uh, so our view is uh, we want to own those pieces of the puzzle. So webinar is an interesting one. Um, we got into webinar because we originally had a great business in audience acquisition. That's where we started. So basically helping people get butts in seats for their events and webinars. 
Then we said, well, now it makes sense to own the webinar platform. Uh, then we launched Boost last year, which was a uh, which is a, a social sharing tool uh, that helped uh, people get more uh, attendees to webinars using the existing attendees to share it, you know, helping them make it easy to share it. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're looking at what are the other things around that. So we just announced an acquisition a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, of a company called IG Leads, which is a uh, lead generation platform uh, that uses interests and kind of social graphs, social signals mm -hmm. to uh, help companies find the right you know prospects. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, tie-in to the existing product base that we have, and we're looking at you know we're looking at other options as well. So we um, we ended up uh, taking Bonsai public last month in December. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and and we did that uh, mainly so that we could shore up our capital base, so we'd be in a better position to go out uh, and do more of these kind of acquisitions, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, you know, we plan to do uh, more of them this year. We're looking at a bunch of different companies in different categories, but um, the, the super high level thinking is everything that, you know, we, we want to own strategically, we want it to be something that is a missing piece of HubSpot. So we can go after, you know, the HubSpot customers and their HubSpot's been a great partner to us, been super supportive uh, of us. And so ultimately, you know, we want to, uh, basically build the products that are the complementary products to mm -hmm. that and uh, and then, you know, work with that customer base uh, to help them solve more and more of their problems. And we want our products to all essentially share the same customer base uh, because then, you know, for us, it's all about customer expansion, focusing on, you know, how do we help customers solve one problem, but then how do we help them solve the second, third, fourth, fifth problem uh, using additional solutions that we have. What do you think it, what do you think is unique about you that has allowed you and Bonsai to be so successful. I mean, you started the company in 2016, so you've been going on, you know, you know, almost almost 10 years now or eight years. What what is it about you as a leader or as a person that you think you bring to the table that has has been important? That's a good question. You know, uh, sometimes I think not that much. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> I would say, you know, maybe maybe one uh, small thing is, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna be in a business like this where you're gonna go try to do a roll up, uh, you have to be good at working with people. You have to find, uh, you have to be able to find deals. You have to be able to make deals uh, with people. So you have to be able to walk into a room with somebody and find a win win uh, where you can both you know, where you can both walk out and feel like you're getting a, a good bargain. And um, and you have to be able to do that in a way that, that you know, it turns out that the company actually is getting a good deal because, uh, you know, a lot of companies, the mistake they make and why most of the time uh, these types of, uh, you know, it, it's very hard to execute on uh, businesses like this is people over-optimize on one thing or the other. They over-optimize on, I'm going to only, I'm going to only make sure that I get a really great deal and therefore I'm going to, you know, screw the other guy. But then you only end up buying companies where for whatever reason, the founder is in a position uh, to, you know, to be willing to be screwed just to get out of it. Right. And that really doesn't work very well for you. Or you end up saying, yeah, sure. I'll just pay whatever they want, or I'll just do whatever they want. And, you know, that puts you in a position um, to, to, to really, for things to not work out financially. So you have to be able to find a balance where, uh, you know, things can work for you financially uh, and where you can end up getting high quality assets uh, at the end of the day. Like that's the only way that this business works. So right. uh, I think, I think being able to, to, you know, work constructively with people has been uh, really important. I mean, uh, early on, I thought it was, you know, if you can write really good code, that would, be the most important thing. And, you know, I still like writing code sometimes, but uh, although they don't really let me do it anymore uh, over here, I, I'm an amateur now, uh, but yeah. So, about people. The title of this show is Listening with Leaders. And if you, I, I think you've probably done your a little due diligence on me. So you know that I teach people how to listen at a very deep level. How important has listening been 
to you in your career trajectory? Um, that's a great question. I think uh, I think uh, I would I would like to take a step back and I would say communication is not what's said. Communication is what's heard. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people think that they've said something and therefore they've communicated it. Um, but making sure that you've been heard is actually not about what you say. It's it's about listening to the person to make sure that you know that they understand you and vice versa, that you understand them. Right. And so um, I, I think, well, you know, uh, in this type of business, if, you, if you're having to negotiate with people, understanding their motivations is very important. Um, sometimes people will come out and tell you that directly. Um, sometimes they will kind of hint at it. Um, sometimes you have to guess a couple of times before they'll tell you. But basically it all comes down to communication. And I think that listening is probably like by a factor of, four or five um, more important part of communication than what is being said. I think that um, a lot of people sit around and focus on wordsmithing the right message. Right. Uh, when in reality, what you need to do first is, you know, is, is, is listen. And the other thing I would say is, I think um, listening is an essential part of making sure that people are receptive to what you have to say. Um, in other words, you know, I'm, I'm not going to call out any specific Middle East conflicts that are going on right now, but basically a lot of them are the result of an inability to listen to or empathize with the other side in any way. Now, absolutely. you know, uh, I think I won't get into why I think that has happened uh, or why that breakdown has occurred. But what I will say, because that's frankly above my pay grade and I don't get paid to make political statements. But what I will say is uh, that, you know, you have, to, if the other side doesn't feel that they've been heard, then they're not going to listen to what you have to say um, in any kind of negotiation, especially in a business negotiation. Yeah, and in any kind of relationship. That's not right. just business. It's in every relationship. And, and the more they feel unheard, uh, the more they're going to stop listening to you. And that's where communication breaks down. And at that point, you can wordsmith whatever you want, uh, but it, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, you know, the most perfectly articulated uh, thing in the world won't make a difference yeah. if, uh, if if nobody's listening to it. So I think that I think you have, you've got a lot of wisdom there. Uh, knowing how to listen so the speaker feels heard from the speaker's frame of reference is really the key to all of this. So when when on listening to you, how do I make sure that you know that I'm really hearing you, that you're really being listened to and validated? And, uh, and, yeah. and to your point, until that happens, communicate true communication is not going to occur. So in any kind of change management process, you know, one thing that I've observed is if you come in um, with, you know, let, let me explain the situation. Let me explain what the problem was. Let me explain what we did about it. Let me explain why you should be happy about this. Um, you'll get about, you know, 10% of people will be happy about it. Uh, about, you know, 50% of people will be indifferent about it. You know, they'll throw up their hands and be like, okay, well, whatever. Just just another day of right. somebody that's not listening to me. And about 40% of people will be pissed off about it. Right. Um, you know, you're never going to make 100% of people happy. But the way that you can get closer is by starting off with coming in and saying, well, what do you think the problem is? You know, what do you think uh, some solutions could be? How do you think we got into this situation? What tell would you, or is something even tell me what's going on? Yeah, what would you do if you were in my situation? Tell me how you feel about this. You know, right. and um, and I think you know usually I try to avoid the tell me how you feels um, by trying to not get into a position where people have extreme negative feelings to begin with. Um, and you can usually do that by, you know, usually, usually if you're in a situation where you're, where you're saying, tell me how you feel, that means that something already went wrong further up the creek, you know, uh, in terms of, in terms of a breakdown of communication. Now, not always, you know, there's definitely, there's always situations that might be outside of your control or, or outside of someone else's control. But if you find yourself, you know, uh, needing to do that too often, you might want to stop and say, Am I am I really engaging early enough in the process? Right. And, and and what I've learned and what I teach is instead of asking the question, tell me how you feel, make it much more open ended. 
tell me what, what's going on. Tell mm -hmm. me what's going on. And then if they are inclined, whether or not they tell you how they feel or not, if they are emotionally aroused, those emotions will surface. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I teach people how to listen to emotions instead of words. And so now you've got the opportunity to start listening to these emotions. And as you reflect back the emotional experience, people feel deeply validated and they yeah. feel heard. And very quickly, they're on board with whatever it is that you want them to be on board with. What's uh, what's an example of that that you might do? That, that's really interesting because, um, you know, we've, we've had a couple of these situations here. Like, I, I won't pretend to be perfect. And, you know, from time to time, we end up in... in well, Give me an example of where somebody came in and they something was going sideways, and I'll show you how. Well, I'll, I'll I'll give you an, a, an example that I saw the other day that wasn't related to bonsai, but it was uh, pretty public, so it might be relevant to your audience. There was a woman, uh, I think her name was Brittany Peach, uh, who worked at Cloudflare as a software or as a, a salesperson, account executive, uh, their software company, right. and uh, she was let go by the HR team, you know, over a Zoom call. Her manager wasn't on the call. And she filmed it, uh, put it on TikTok. Ooh. And, you know, it obviously was it was just really ugly reflection on but really for both sides, I think. Um, who, who knows what will end up happening, who, who the winners of this thing will be. But I think the, the scenario was, you know, she it was actually a perfect example of what we were just talking about, where, you know, they get 15 seconds into the into the conversation and she says, you know, let me stop you right there. Like, let me explain to you why I shouldn't be let go. And, you know, it turned into this, you know, 10 minute back and forth. And Argument. I don't know if you've been able to watch the video or not. No, I haven't. But but if let, let's just suppose that I'm her and and I've got some HR people here who I don't even know who are trying to explain to me that they're going to let me go. And so, and so I would say something like I'd be listening and and I'd say, so you guys are really anxious. And, and you're really you're you're worried and concerned and you're really afraid that this is going to be upsetting and you're distressed over this. And and the idea that um, somebody like me might become reactive is a little scary to you. And. You know, you basically feel disrespected by your superiors because you've been put in a position that you don't want to be in and you've been ignored and unappreciated, and unsupported, and yet you still have to do this work. And it's really upsetting to you and really frustrating to you. And you wish you weren't sitting here across in a Zoom call with me on this call. Now, imagine how would they feel if she said something like that, validated all the upset that they are obviously having. What do you think they would do? I, I, I think that's a, I think it's it, it, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think um, that, that this, you know, that reminds me of like, you know, the the biblical proverb of, you know, cast the first stone, right? Uh, I think that in that situation, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to continue, they're either going to continue with their mandate to fire the woman and she would have grace enough to accept it and, and make sure that the people on the other side felt validated, but they would leave on terms where they, those people would walk out of the room saying, we just really screwed up. We lost one of our best employees. That was really stupid. Maybe we need to rethink this. Or, they would say, you know, in listening to you on this, maybe we need to rethink this. Tell you what, we're going to cancel. We're going to close out the call. We'll get back to you. Right. Um, because so rarely do human beings really listen to each other. And when one human being listens to another and validates them, it completely changes the relationship. Yeah. When I teach leaders this stuff, this is how leaders can build trust and loyalty on their teams is by instead of listening to the words, listen to the emotions. I think like one thing I've always tried to um, keep in mind, you know, personally, and also just advice that I would always give to anybody uh, who asked, you know, is, you know, in most companies, you're going to have a last day, right? Right. People, people remember your first day, but they really remember your last day. Right. Um, you know, all the days in between can kind of be blurry. And, uh, you know, I've had people that have left the company and I felt like, you know, man, I would love to work with that person again. Uh, you know, yeah, had to let this person go, but maybe it was just a bad fit here. Maybe it just didn't work out this time. Maybe there's something going on in their personal life. Let's check back in, in, in a couple of years and see where they're at. And let's see if we can do it again. Right. And, and in some cases we've done that. We've had a lot of people that have come back to bonsai. Actually, we've had probably 
uh, I don't know, I can think of probably like four or five, six people wow. off the top of my head that have left and then come back. Um, and and then there's other people that that leave. And on the way out, you're like, geez, I hope I never have to see that person again. <laughs> um, exactly correct. You know, you're you're right. I mean, it, you know, the re the reaction in the moment in that case, I think I don't know that it would have changed the outcome for her. It may or may not have, um, but it would have changed the aftermath, I think. Right. Um, you know, now, I mean, obviously this thing went viral and we'll see whether that was a ends up being a good or a bad thing for her career. I don't know. But probably not. Anyway, yeah. one more question. I'll let you go. Oh, please. Uh, so, so, Joe, what's one thing about yourself that we wouldn't know about unless you revealed it to us? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, you know, I'm a pretty public person, so I don't know. That's a little tricky. I'll, 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 I'll actually uh, use this to plug kind of a passion project of mine. Um, so you, you may or may not know about th this about me, but um, it, it's not the thing that usually comes up in the headlines. So it might. So my night job um, is I'm the vice chairman of the Seattle Symphony. And when I was kids. Kid, that's right. When I was a kid, I used to play violin. And uh, I was very, yeah, and, and and I got into this because when I was in like fourth or fifth grade, the North Carolina Symphony came uh, and they played in a little auditorium in the small town that I lived in. I mean, I lived in a town of like 2,400 people, but they came and, and performed and it was really a, a cool experience. And I got to go backstage and see the musicians and all that. And, and you know, that encouraged me. And ultimately I ended up playing violin and, um, and so, you know, now I work with the symphony. I've been on the board for, I think this is my third year. And um, I uh, lead the committee that's responsible for, we call it community engagement. Um, about half of that is working with, you know, cultural groups. So indigenous groups or Asian Americans, groups like that to, you know, engage them to either come to Benaroya Hall, perform at Benaroya Hall or us to go out into their communities or whatever. Um, but then the other half of it is working with kids in education. and um, we bring a lot of kids. I think this year we're planning to bring, you know, seven, eight thousand kids to Benaroya Hall uh, for Link Up. We actually just did this really neat thing. A couple of uh, the, the the documentary came out a few weeks ago, uh, and you can go uh, search for it. It's called Young Composers, uh, and with Seattle Symphony. And uh, what we did is we had ten kids that were in middle school or high school. Uh, I think the oldest was in high school, maybe maybe early, early college, but basically all teenagers. And uh, they got to compose pieces that to then have them performed by the Seattle Symphony live. How cool is that? Which is which is incredible. So Jeremy Jolly, who's the guy that runs the education department at the symphony, who's the kind of guy I work with the most closely on that committee. You know, he has a, a, a post uh, post grad, you know, a master's degree or a PhD or something in in um, music composition, I think it is. And you know, he he was saying in the in his interview, I was speaking to him about this that you know he went to school and spent three years writing a dissertation, which was essentially a big piece of music to have co to compose, and it never even got performed um, because it's very very hard to get a piece of music performed that you've composed. Right. And so the the ability to give these kids um, you know, one of the top symphony orchestras in the country is actually going to play the piece that you composed. And it's such a cool thing. And when you watch the documentary, you get to see these kids talking about it, going through their process, like sitting at home, writing music after, you know, after they've done their chores or whatever. It's just really the coolest thing. That's, that's uh, really cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I love doing stuff like that. You wouldn't know it, but I'm a jazz violinist. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I play jazz. So you, Come, you should come to the symphony sometime. Yeah. Next time you're in Seattle, let's go. There you go. There you go. Well, this has been a great conversation, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Doug, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely.